that prayer. All right, last time we uh, finished looking at the uh, history and teachings of the Jehovah's Jehovah's Witness uh, Church. And so today we're starting a new one uh, in our study. We're talking about Christ, the Christian scientist. And so we'll go through and uh, share with you some things that Brother Jennings had in his book and uh, make a few points about that. Again, I'll say once again, I'm not an expert at all in this field. If y'all have comments or things that, you know, when I think about it, have I ever had a conversation with somebody that's a Christian scientist? I can't recall that I have. But uh, if y'all have something to, to bring to bear to any of this, please feel free to do so. All right. According to Brother Jennings, the history of this movement, and I think there, if I'm, um, if I remember correctly, it seems like there's one on uh, South Austin Street, isn't it? I want to say there's a little building down past 98 somewhere where there was a little library or something. But anyway, I may remember that wrong. It was in Montgomery. Okay. All right. A mental healer by the name of Dr. Quimby appeared early in the 19th century in Portland, Maine. He made experiments in healing by hypnotism and mesmerism. One of his students was a Mrs. Me uh, Mary Baker Eddy, who from 1862 to 1865 had attracted some notoriety as a mesmeric subject. And the, the dates there are interesting to me. Uh, this has nothing to do with it, but that was at the, the peak of the Civil War going on strong. So I don't know if there was a connection there between people wanting to have their health restored if they've been wounded. I don't know if there's any, any connection there or not. You know, during the war, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes on. Yeah. People, people are interested in... Yes, yeah, that, that is true. That is true. I've heard people say if... Um, what is it that they say about the uh, Pentecostals? If you... Um, if you... Somebody has health issues and uh, they have some money, you can take them for everything they got. Something along that line. You know, people, people care about the health. Certainly so. One year after Dr. Quimby died in 1865, Mrs. Eddy claimed to have received a discovery of the doctrines of Christian science. She wrote these philosophies down in a book entitled Science and Health, strikingly similar to a book authored by Dr. Quimby, Science of Man. Mrs. Eddy copyrighted, copyrighted her book and sold, sold it in several editions that had some revenues. She made quite a bit of money, as you'll see here in just a minute. The first edition appeared in 1875, followed by many editions containing many changes Science and Health with the Key to the Scriptures. I have never read that book. The first Science and Health Association was organized in 1876 with six pupils. The first Science Club was established by her in Boston in 1879 with 26 members. She was the pastor of this, the Mother Church. All other churches of this connection are branch churches of the Mother Church. Membership is always run about three women to every man, Church of Christ scientists, is the official church name. Mrs. Eddy's career was a checkered one, having thrice married and once divorced. She reaped a financial fortune. Despite her insistence that nothing material is real, she amassed a worth over $3 million by the time of her death in 1910. She had said, there is no death. Well, I would say that was not the case with her, is it? So, you know, I will say in... Um, Kind of, I, I don't, I, I will share with you the uh, points that Brother Jennings has as far as some of the teachings and this sort of thing. Like I said, I'm not an expert at what they teach and believe. But um, the idea of us being as healthy as we can, certainly there's nothing wrong with that. Now, we want to have health, uh, making a church out of it with that there is uh, a problem with me creating a, a different church other than the one that, that Christ created, of course, is a problem. But the idea of, you know, you think about, I heard uh, Frank Chesser quote one time uh, in a sermon, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, which um, says, Bodily exercise profiteth a little, but godliness with contentment is a great gain. And I remember um, Brother St. John quoting that passage often as the reason why he didn't exercise. <laughs> but I heard, uh, I heard Brother Chesser say one time, notice that in, it did say that it had some profit. It says bodily exercise profiteth little. There is some profit. Brotherly, brotherly. That's what they were, man. All right, all right. Probably little, but it's probably the brotherly. Yes, sir. It profits some. It's some profits some. Brotherly. 
All right, all right. But anyway, we think about bodily exercise and exercising the body and, and keeping up. There is some profit there. And Brother Frank used to say, I remember kind of joking because he, he loved to eat. I may eat with him a couple of times. One time when I was in Montgomery, went to a pizza buffet with him, and he put a hurting on that <laughs> pizza buffet. It yeah, did not make him money. But uh, he said that's, that's what he would do. Like he told us his trick of memorizing scripture. I, I thought he had a photographic memory. I heard him one time quote the entire 48 verses of Acts 10, which I was blown away by him being able to do that. But he said he would write verses on note cards, and he would walk every morning. But he said he walked every morning to walk off that food so he could stay in decent shape. But uh, anyway, so there, there is there is some profit uh, to keeping ourselves in shape. And of course, in Romans 12 and verse 1, it talks about us keeping our body, our body being a living sacrifice. So we want to keep ourselves in as good a shape as we can for as long as we can. So we can be on this planet as long as we can to do as much good as we can in this planet. So there's, there's something to trying to keep ourselves healthy. So nothing against that. I want to say that up front. So us eating right. And I do decent. I don't do great uh, at that uh, exercise. Nothing wrong with that uh, type of thing. But in the scriptures, our spiritual health is so much more important than our physical health. Amen. Our spiritual well-being, making sure we're right with the Lord, making sure our sins are washed away. That's the ultimate thing that is important for each of us. So here's the first point that Brother Jennings uh, makes. That's a misprint. It should be Mary. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy is the head of the church and was its first pastor in Boston. That's what they say. That obviously contradicts uh, so many scriptures that we are familiar with. Jesus is the only potentate in 1 Timothy 6, 14 and 15. says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the only potentate. He is the only king. He is the only Lord. Not Mary Baker Eddy. Not any other name you want to fill in the blank with. Not Joseph Smith, not uh, the Russell likes, uh, any of that. Jesus is but the one. The yes. God, that means the brethren. The word God? Yeah. Okay. God right. couldn't do this all by itself. You know what that peanut represents? That three peanuts on five? <laughs> I'll take your word for it. I'm not a peanut okay, expert. Well, that's, 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 <clears throat> how plain is that? <laughs> yes, sir. A man put a seed in the ground and he expects for it to come up? Yes, sir. Every now and then, the peanut do, they have three fathers, and that represents God, He, Jesus, and she, He, the Holy Spirit. That comes to brethren. Well, that's a great point, brothers. It's, it's kind of like. Well, the point is, <laughs> was God by Himself? Elohim. Well, who else is with him? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And who else? In the very beginning? Yeah. Nobody. Do you think God could do all of this by himself? Yeah. Create the world? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. He one element. Each element got 60,000 vessels in. God never just up there chilling. They had nothing to do. Jesus and the Holy Spirit was up there with him. Absolutely. Sure. Okay, that's what that peanut represents, man. That's a great point. That's what I said. Yeah, that's a great point. Is it? God knew one of his best of a big plan of salvation. Now. Great point. It's kind of like we were talking about um Brother Henry mentioned the other day about the three uh the three forms of water. I thought it was a good illustration. Ice, water, vapor. So good point. I see how science religion out. Science about Scientology. Yeah, it was just one I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know if that's related to this or not. Very well, maybe. From what I recall, um, I don't think it is related because um, um, I'm trying to think of the man's name right this second. It's not coming to me because um, he's got like he goes by his first name, his middle initial, and his last name. It won't come to me, but. Um, he actually was told that the smartest thing he, he could ever do if he, if he ever wanted to become rich, and I mean filthy rich, is to make your own religion. Uh, 
can't I can almost say his, his name too. I think they won't come to me, but um, but they are they're way out there. I mean, it, it's just um, it's more of a, a business than it is a, a religion, really, uh, from what I've understood. I think I know. So I, 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 yeah. Say the guy's name. I think I've seen a commercial. I know who you're talking about, yeah, but I can't. Exactly. I can't think of it. Um, um, well, and, and there's uh, there's an actress that used to be wrapped up in that, and she has been on t uh, been on TV before talking about what all she went through, and they've got these levels of well, and um, um, Tom Cruise and a couple other yeah. famous. Uh, people are where we're in, and, uh, and, and, and even they seem to be backing out of it, saying that uh, this is not much of a religion, it's more of a business. Right, like, right. Um, sorry, I can't think of the guy's name. Yeah, so, I know. But, I, yeah. but it, it um, I've never heard, I've never heard one thing ever uh, out of any of them, and I'm not saying it can't be but i'm saying i, I heard it, but you hardly ever hear them ever say anything about god christ the the, the, the godhead the only thing they seem to ever want to talk about is accomplishments and, right and, and earning and, and the level that they're at right and, uh, and um, the grand kuba or whatever they're calling themselves right uh, it, it was each to the step that they've gotten up there and uh and they don't they don't care what your belief is in, as far as God is concerned. Uh, they'll accept you no matter what, and 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 not try to change you. And that's one of the biggest things that they seem to advocate. And um, and it's just um, it they do um, they do kind of take it personally when someone wants to break off away from them. And they will harass you, at least according to that one. And I, I know I know who I'm, I'm thinking about, but I can't think of her name either, but she was saying that they made her life miserable and, uh, because she finally realized that it was not the one true church. And um, so uh, I don't know if she ever did find the, the actual truth yeah. or, or the one true church, but she did realize that that yeah, but um, yeah, but that was Scientologist. Okay, all right, very good, very interesting. Uh, so Jesus is the only head of the church. Ephesians one verse twenty, which he wrought in Christ, talking about God when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That's pretty plain. So it's not Mary Baker Eddy or anybody else. Jesus is the head. He has all power and authority, as he said in Matthew 20 and 18. It says, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Number three, pastors, elders in the scripture, she called herself a pastor, were required to be the husband of one wife. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, how, how could she be a husband at all? When I was reading this, I was thinking, Brother Jenny is be shocked today at the stuff you see with the trans, uh, transgender stuff. And so there's some women that claim to be a husband in their relationship. But anyway, uh, the Bible says this in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, etc. So that's one of the qualifications to be a pastor, be an elder, the husband of one wife. Titus 1, 5, and 6 says the same thing. For this cause left out the in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused or right or unruly, etc. And of course, as we know, there's other qualifications too. But one of them that's specifically mentioned in both places, the husband of one wife. She cannot be a pastor. Number four, women are limited in their participation in public church assemblies to a place of subjection and silence. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches, 
for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. That's pretty plain. They are to be silent in leading the assembly. That very plain, brother. That's exactly right. First Timothy 2 and verse 12. But I suffer not. I allow not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Can't misunderstand that. You have to try to misunderstand that passage. A second point that Brother Jennings makes that they teach the Bible is not pure, is defiled by material and moral senses. And we've heard, had, uh, heard others that have said that. Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon to correct the mistakes, and this is, is how he put it. So again, kind of the same view. So here, so Mary Baker Eddy is going to write to set the record straight, I guess, is her thinking. Of course, we know what the Bible says about itself. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6, Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. All 31,102 verses in the Bible are pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God's word is inspired, and God has reserved his word throughout history, so that you and I have it. Romans 3 and verse 4 says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. God is true. If God says something, and Mary Baker Eddy says something else, better go with God. That's the one that is true. 2 Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 2 Peter 1.21 for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible is not the thoughts of men. It's not men dictating something to somebody. It's God inspiring them with those words to reveal to us. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, and in two other places, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. He said in John 12, 48, the words I've spoken unto you, the same shall judge you in the last day. So we're going to be judged by his words. His words will never pass away. The word of God is perfect. James 1, 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And we're, fam we're familiar with Jude 3. Uh, the Bible has been once and all delivered for mankind. Uh, everything that we need has been revealed. We're told uh, Peter wrote in is it 1 Peter 1, 4, 2 Peter 1, and 4, verse 4. So we have everything that we need to be pleasing to God. Yes, sir. If I may add to what you were saying about all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Absolutely. The, uh, the, five, the, the, the next verse. Um, I'd just like to read that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished and do all good works. And, uh, good point. I think about that quite often because the fact that I don't know, I can't quote. I, I, mean, I'm, I know a few few verses. Uh, I wish I knew a lot more. I, I, I wish I did to too. Dream into, uh, be earnest in trying to be able to recite more verses. But that right there is the thing that, that helps me probably as much as anything. To know Absolutely. That God has given me everything that I need. Yes, and all I need to do is stop being lazy and, and more diligent. Um, and I, I don't mean to put myself down and say I'm lazy, but, but at the same time. We all, we all can say that. We all, we we all can, can say that. Kind of get there at times. And sure. Need to well, I know a lot of times if I get started reading something else, I'll start feeling guilty because I'm not actually reading the scriptures instead of whatever nonsense I'm reading. But, um, but that that really speaks to me loud and clear. Well, it's like David talked about meditate on your word day and night. Exactly. Brother Donald, you had a point. Exactly right. The word of God is inspired. Well, why would Jesus say, I speak this not? He's stepping out of the inspired word. What do you think that's for? He said, what do you think that's for? Why do you say that? What passage are you talking about, brother? In Corinthians. Is that Paul? Paul writing Corinthians? Yeah. Okay. 
Does that speak this not of commandment? First, uh, First Corinthians seven. You're talking right. about talking about the marriage and stuff, right? Yeah. Why would he say that? I don't know, brother. That's that's uh, another. Thing. We've we've had some discussions about that. That's that's a good question. That is reference to Jesus. Jesus is not addressing while he is on earth. In other words, he he, he says that Jesus. Says that Jesus cannot address that particular issue that Paul was talking about. But speaking about the mission, but not not the Paul of Jesus that said it per se. I think that's what he said. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yes, sir. He, only a Bible scholar would figure that out. Yeah. You know, he's saying, I'm stepping out of the commandment and standing in the gap for God. Well, it's a good point. It's like Jesus, when he was talking to the apostles, uh, you recall in John 13, 14, 15, 16, he said, many other things I have to say to you at this time. We're out of time. You can't hear it. But he says, I'm going to guide you in all truth. At first, I've heard you quote many times, John 16, 13, talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide them in all truth. So uh, absolutely, great point. It's like, you know, I love, I like in my Bible to have the words of Christ in red. But in a sense, every word in the New Testament is should be in red because it's Christ's words, you know, through other people. But that's a great point. All right. Let me see. Here's the next point. The uh, Church of uh, Church of Christ scientist originated in Boston in 1876. The scripture states that Jerusalem is where the church was established. And we see that in a number of places. We see that in Isaiah 2. I think it's also Micah chapter 4 uh, says something very similar to that. It says, many people should go and say, come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Pretty plain prophecy. So God's word will proceed the house of God, the church of God, would begin in Jerusalem. That's what the scriptures say. What's that? It didn't start in Maine, did it? <laughs> it? It didn't say anything about Boston there, did it? Uh, Luke 24, 47. Jesus, uh, as he is giving final instructions to the apostles before his ascension, said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. That's where it would start. Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And we know from the context, they were in the city of Jerusalem. That's where the church began. Two, scriptures teach that the time was, at the time of the church being established, is plainly taught in the scriptures, uh, would be when power came and when the Spirit came. The first Pentecost after the resurrection of Christ. In Joel 2, verse 28, and uh, again, that prophecy goes down to about verse 32, if I recall correctly, said, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. In Acts 2 and verse 4, we see the fulfillment of that when they received this power. It says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I don't think I put in here... Um, Peter mentions in Acts 2.16, I think it is, he says, this is the fulfillment of what Joel said. I think I told y'all had a, uh, one, a parent of one of my students at school four or five years ago that emailed me. I was saying that to the students. I guess I went home and said that. And the, so the mama was upset. I said, no, no, no. This, these days is the fulfillment of the... Peter said, this is the fulfillment of that uh, there in Acts 2. Uh, Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power. This is what Jesus had predicted as far as when these things would occur. It says, And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. So again, Jesus said it begin at Jerusalem when you received power. And I did not put, I should have put Mark 9 and verse 1, but you remember what he said there. There's some of you standing here that shall not taste of death until the kingdom of God comes with power. So Jesus had predicted that would happen. It did. Just like he said it was going to come in their lifetime. Another one from a time element would be in uh, Daniel 2 and verse 44 when it said, In the days of these kings, a prophecy of the church, what kings? The context clearly shows, talking about the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire has come and gone, so the church has been established. Brother Jennings makes a third point. He says, Every plant which the Father did not plant shall be rooted up. 
Matthew 15, 13. But he, Jesus, actually said, every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. So make sure the things that we teach, the things that we believe, are that seed. Brother Donald talked about the peanut, and that's a great point. Jesus said in Luke 8 and verse 11, talking about the parable of the sower and the seed, the seed is the word of God. So when you plant that seed, it sprouts what God intended. It sprouts His plant when that occurs. I right, a fourth point that Brother Jennings mentions, uh, their, their teaching. A Christian scientist is one who accepts and practices Christian science as a religion. In uh, reference to that, uh, Brother Jenny says, number one, Paul once referred to science falsely so-called in 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, and these have erred from the faith of Christ. And here's that passage. It says, O Timothy, I think these are the last two verses in 1 Timothy. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And, you know, that's a, a, you could get off into a, a big tangent on that. Science falsely so-called. Uh, to me, evolution uh, fits in that category. You think about how many people have had their faith destroyed by a public school teacher or by something on the television or something on the radio to cast doubt in their mind about the one true God. Sad. So sad. Two, Mary Baker Eddy's religion was neither Christian nor truly scientific. On right, a fifth point, the name Church of Christ Scientist is on all buildings and literature. Jesus referred to the church as my church. Again, not belonging to Mary Baker Eddy or to these Christian scientists or anybody else. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock. The confession that Peter had made, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice he calls it his. It belongs to him. It was purchased with his blood. It's not something to be purchased with money. You know, Peter talked about that in 1 Peter 1.18. We're not redeemed with gold or silver or any worldly possession. But he says in verse 19, with the precious blood of Christ. There's not a greater price that could have been paid for the church. And how did, I've heard uh, Brother Frank Chester, I'm about Frank Chester, heard a lesson he taught one time talking about how, what that means and how important that is that the church is sanctified by the blood of Christ. And that excludes anything else that we could dream up or try to add to that. But Lord, you had a point. Next, I see Simon kind of got reprobate because he tried to purchase the spirit, you know. Yes, sir. Money. Yes, sir. Which was with good. Great point. Great point. So uh, Paul says to the Ephesian elders here in Acts 20, Take heed therefore unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, notice this, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Not a greater purchase price on the planet that could be paid for the church. And that's another thing that just kind of hits me the wrong way anytime somebody says, well, give me the man, not the plan. I, I don't want the church. You don't want the church? You don't want, want the thing that was bought with the blood of Jesus? Three, Paul, referring to various congregations, said, The church of Christ. In Romans 16, 16, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The church of Christ salutes you. Again, it belongs to him. Very much. Sir. From time to time, we will hear Brother Joel talk about how you cannot put a price on blood. How much greater is that blood than any drop of blood that any of us can give? That one drop of his blood is greater than all the blood in all the world. Well said. His blood was completely innocent, wasn't it? Pure, pure and innocent. Absolutely pure. Absolutely. Great and point. Vessel got 60,000 vessels in each wow. body there. Yes, sir. 60,000. Incredible. So that one drop of blood. What a God we have. Amen. Amen. Life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. Luke 17, 11. Great, great point. All right. Point six. Mrs. Eddy reinstated primitive Christianity and its lost element of healing. Well, primitive Christianity is what we're all about. We've heard many sermons on that, that we're trying to establish Christianity as it was 
in biblical times. But again, you see that that was what so much of what this particular religion is about, physical healing. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have good health and desiring to have good health and keeping ourselves in shape. But that the purpose, as we know, of the miracles performed in Bible times was not just for that physical healing. Somebody was healed physically and appreciated that. That was a good thing. But it was to bring people to Christ, show that, to show them that what Jesus was saying was true. What the apostles were saying was true. To confirm the word, as we read in Mark 16, 20 and Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. Here's a quote from this science and health book. I must know the science of this healing, and I won my way to absolute conclusions through divine revelations, reason, and demonstration. And she missed the whole point here of the healing. The healing that Jesus did, and Peter and Paul, what about science? About the power of God? That he's able to speak somebody well again, to show his power. Like the, the man that he healed, as y'all recall, that was let down through the roof. An uh, amazing thing. And uh, so many lessons. I think Brother Joel preached a lesson on that a while back. So you think about that guy getting healed, but why did Christ heal him? To show that he had power on earth to forgive sins, he said in Matthew 9 and verse 6. Do they believe that you're, you're saying, <clears throat> you really religious enough in their th uh, theory that you're able to heal yourself, if you don't need doctors after this? Or? Apparently, that is what they believe. And, and I've heard of... Um, I have known some Pentecostals that kind of believe the same thing. I've known some of them that will not go to a doctor because say, well, we don't need physicians. I've heard people go to the court because doctors want to do something to their children. Right. Their right. Now, now, the the law has gone off the hook because now they want to say that uh, that child needs to be male, not female. And they'll take them to court, which is really way off and it's disturbing. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I believe. Same thing that you were saying that how crazy some of this stuff can get. Um, you know, it, it, and I sometimes I hesitate to talk because I talk so much. Um, I just really appreciate you doing this, brother. That we go through each and every religion because that's one of the things that I try to do whenever I talk to just anybody that that is not in the church. That if you'll study uh, the the Lord's Church, the the actual biblical church, and study why it is perfect, then maybe that'll help you to realize which one is the perfect church, the right church, the one and only church. Because there is so many out there that will, will spin it in a in a million different directions and, and lead you astray. So just by, I mean, this is one of the things, one of the greatest things that I think I had learned while I was in school was teaching what a lot of these others teach and what they are trying to get you to follow after when it is not the one true church. Well, first, I appreciate the compliment, and this study has helped me, too. A lot of things I've ever reminded of, too. Um, I can think of times people I've studied with in the past that were part of a church, and they really had no idea what their church even taught. I've seen that. Y'all probably have, too, you know, that just really didn't, didn't know. I remember having a discussion with somebody on baptism one time, uh, two guys I had a discussion with, and I was— showing them what, what the Bible says about baptism, they were not in their head. And I'm thinking, I know the place you don't you attend does not teach that, but they didn't know. But Donald, you had a point. No, sir. Yeah, y'all covered it all. But yeah, yeah, I think um, you know, the idea of some is that, you know, they don't need a need a doctor and again if I'm holy enough, God will heal me and this sort of thing. So I have run across that uh from various people. I've heard um for somebody say about the Apostle Paul you know, Paul, you know, had the ability to perform miracles and those around him, but he always carried a doctor with him everywhere he went. You know, Luke was with him. The beloved position was with him everywhere he went. All right. Good points. All right. In response, Brother Jennings says, number one, those who are physically sick have need of a physician. That's a good point. Jesus said this right here, Matthew 9 and verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. It's interesting that Jesus acknowledged that. A physician, a doctor is a good thing. 
So people that are physically sick need a physical doctor. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't prohibit somebody going to see uh, a doctor. Two, Jesus healed miraculously, miraculously and even raised from the dead, but told his disciples that they would do greater works. John 14, verse 12 says, what is, uh, what is greater than healing the sick or restoring sight to the blind? And I say amen to what Brother Jennings said right here. It is saving the souls of men through the preaching of the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This greater work could later be done because Jesus said, I go to my Father. That is so true. If somebody is in bad health throughout their life, but they're right with God, but what a blessing that is. What, they, they got the ultimate blessing. If somebody is in great health in this life and they don't know God, they're not a Christian, what good is it going to do? It's kind of like Jesus said about possessions in uh, Matthew 16. Was it profit a man if he could gain the whole, whole world and lose his soul? Well, same thing. What would it profit a man if he could live to be a thousand years old and lose his own soul? What good would it do? Or, or, or quote every word of the Bible. Of course, we know Satan knows every word of the Bible. True. So the thing is, is without, the, without knowing Christ in the truest sense, then we're wasting our time. That's exactly right. Well said. Well said. Well, you said it first. <laughs> A good point. Uh, three, physical miraculous healing, drinking deadly poison, etc., was performed by Christ and his apostles for the specific purpose of confirming the word. And we'll read that in a couple of passages. Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard in from the scriptures, lest at any time we should let them slip. We don't let the, want to let the words we hear in the scriptures slip. We want to put them into practice. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was, notice this, confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. That was the purpose of all these things. Uh, and people received some physical benefits. Those that were healed in these ways certainly received some physical benefits and were thankful for it, as we say in the Scriptures. But the main purpose was to confirm that what the apostles were saying was the truth. And at the same time, it didn't say that, that we rightly can test God by drinking something poison. That's not what it says. It says if you possibly end up drinking something poison, you should be healed. So, again, going back to the original testing of yeah. Christ by Satan, that, you know, why don't you just jump off the, the, uh, the, the temple uh, and, and, uh, and, and know that God will, will save you? Well, uh, we are not to test God. That's, that's foolishness uh, anytime we want to test God because we know that God is there. We don't need to test him to figure out whether he's there. Absolutely. And again, Christ said that I'm not going to do tricks for you. Right. Just just for you to entertain. And of course, that's exactly what uh, uh, some folks kind of seem to think that it was all about uh, uh, watching a, uh, a really neat trick. And, uh, and there, there was a greater purpose behind doing a miracle. It was like Paul getting bit by the poisonous snake there on the island of Malta in Acts 28. You know, he wasn't snake handling at that time, but he was bit by a snake and everybody yeah, looked and right. was expecting him to drop dead and didn't. So, but again, that opened a door to him to be able to minister to the people of Malta uh, there for three months. You know, that, that's, that's a lot of faith too, because it, it, the snake's on him, so he takes it over and he shakes it like this into the fire. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I would be a little bit nervous. <laughs> just going, okay, no problem. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but we are we are blessed that we we have not seen Christ face to face like they were able to by him. But as long as we walk in the way that we ought to walk according to the will of God, and, uh, and we are blessed even more that we uh, we live by faith. Good point. Good point. All right, Mark 16, 20. This is one that Leonard Johnson in college told me when somebody asked about the purpose of miracles, always remember this verse. And I thought this is a good passage. It says, They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and 
confirming the word with signs following. So that was the purpose for the signs. Again, people did receive some, as I say, some physical benefit. Those were healed. But the more important purpose was a spiritual purpose in these things that were done. A fourth point Brother, Brother Jennings makes. All revelation of truth was complete in the first century. Jude 3. The faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Uh, Jude verse 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which is once delivered unto the saints. So the faith has been once delivered. You know, and one of the things, whether it be Mary Baker Eddy, or whether it goes back to our study of uh, the Catholic Church or so many of these others that uh, we've looked at, so many times that people think, well, I've got a better idea than so-and-so. You know, I've, God has revealed something to me that he didn't. And so that seems to be the source of that. But Jude writes and says, it's been once delivered unto the saints. Five, once fully revealed, confirmed by signs and recorded by competent witnesses, the truth was completely delivered and there was no longer need for confirming that truth again and again. It has been confirmed. And, you know, the blessing to your point, Brother Scott, Another point I heard, heard Frank Chester say uh, again one time, talking about the, um, the transfiguration. Think about what, a, what an incredible thing that would have been for Peter, James, and John to have sit, been there on that mountain. Something is Mount Hermon. We don't know where. But being on that mountain, and you see your Savior begin to glow, and you see Moses and Elijah appear with him. What an, what an incredible thing that would be. You think what a faith-building thing that would be. But Peter talks about that in 2 Peter 1, that particular incident. And then in verse 19, he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. So you and I having the written word is a more sure word of prophecy than even the miracles they saw. So what a blessing that is, that you and I have access to this word anytime we want to. People back in Jesus' day didn't. So you say, well, Jesus, and people in Jesus' day got to see the miracles and all that. Yes, and I would have loved to have seen those things. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say, I would have been amazed to have seen the things that Jesus did. But by the same token, those individuals didn't have the written New Testament like we do. What a blessing that is. Well, Scott? Every time I hear about the um, transfiguration, um, I read that they knew who Moses was. Did somebody tell them, or did they just simply see him and know who he was? Again, that would be my greatest um, disappointment, not making it to heaven, to be able to walk up and see people and know who they are without actually needing to. Uh, and, and, and as great as it is, is all the it, so many of my heroes there. I'm really looking forward to seeing Caleb. I really appreciate what Caleb did. He spoke up when not, when when, when everyone else was silent, and didn't wait for anybody to back him. He stepped up. He said, "If God be for us, who can be against us?" And that, to me, was one of the greatest things that a man can do. Is not wait. To see if anyone else is going to back up his words right. and to uh, and to agree with him. I appreciate some of your work. I'm on the table. Is that you, Keith? Well, actually, Daniel did one. I can't remember. I don't know if I did or not. I, did. Daniel, I can't remember. I finally found my Daniel sermon. Maybe I can okay. do that sometime. But, uh, I, I, Really appreciate it because I just always. Uh, and the thing is, is he didn't ask for anything. It was only God that came to him, told him that he would actually give him the first choice. He didn't ask God for the first choice. But the other thing I like about it is the fact that God told him he would give him that. So when um, um, who took over after Moses? Joshua. Oh, Joshua. When Joshua spoke up and, and started to divide them up, <laughs> excuse me, no offense, I think that's my turn. Yeah. I will take that. Yeah. And then Caleb said when he was 85, I'm, I'm just as strong as I was back when I was 40. But Absolutely. Thank you for your good attention and good comments.